It was a usual bright day in the Guanacaste Conservation Area located in Costa Rica. The year was 1997. The animals and plants were thriving here and had never looked better. That was when, out of nowhere, many trucks appeared approaching the forest from far away. These trucks made their way along the track and surprisingly dumped the cargo they were carrying in the middle of the conservation. They left as quickly as they had arrived. Confusing, right? The cargo they dropped was even more puzzling. It wasn't some sort of waste or dumpster content. Instead, these trucks had unloaded orange peels. Over the coming year, more than a thousand trucks drove into this beautiful natural reserve and dumped a whopping 12,000 metric tons of orange peel in this place. Was someone trying to vandalize the conservation? Were they trying to destroy the natural habitat in some way, or was it a plan to destroy the natural elements using a natural deterrent in order to urbanize the area? Well, we've done some homework to find out the strange story behind this clash between man and nature, and in doing so have come across many similar ones too. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and give this video a thumbs up so you don't have to miss out on any of these stories. The Orange Peel Project The events leading to this orangey mess were set in motion in the year 1976. Daniel Jansen and Winnie Horwax were students who graduated from Princeton University in the same year. They were focused on building their careers and aimed to make sure that endangered tropical ecosystems had a future. They started working as ecologists in the University of Pennsylvania. They also worked as advisors for a while at the Guanacaste Conservation Area. Costa Rica only constitutes 0.03% of the Earth's surface, but it's home to about 6% of the world's biodiversity. Jansen and Hallwax wanted to preserve this ecosystem, no matter what the cost. But like any natural habitat, this one was also threatened by industrialization. In 1995, Del Oro, a fruit juice company, established a huge factory in the extensive grove surrounding this conservation area in the bordering regions between Costa Rica and Nicaragua. The conservation organization had tried to acquire this land previously for keeping the forest safe from hazardous material and pollution caused by industry. But Jansen and Hallwax were aware that they needed to make a deal that would benefit both sides. Therefore, in exchange for the borderland, the conservation allowed Del Oro to dump their waste in the conservation park. Now, this may seem like a deal with the devil, allowing industrial waste to be dumped in the tropical forests, but the two ecologists stipulated that acquiring the borderland for the reserve was important despite the drawbacks. The contract between the two parties had some binding conditions. Firstly, Del Oro was only allowed to dump agricultural waste in the reserve, which was mainly pulp and orange peel. The company was not allowed to use any pesticides on the crops so they don't affect the native plants. The pulps were to be rinsed in limonene oil, to which Del Oro happily agreed, as this oil could then be sold for use in the household cleaning products. They were also only allowed to dump the peel on parts of the park that had been used for cattle grazing previously, as soil quality here had already deteriorated. Del Oro found the conditions weird but acceptable. They were glad to have an outlet for dumping the useless pulp and peels for free. Jansen and Hallwax were confident this would work, so they made a deal to receive a thousand or so trucks full of Del Oro's agricultural waste every year for two decades. This meant about a quarter of a million metric tons of waste would be dumped in the reserve in total. What exactly was their goal here? Unfortunately, their plan fell victim to jealousy when a rival juice company called Tico Fruit stepped in. They were angry that their company had to overhaul the waste disposal system, a problem Del Oro didn't face anymore. Therefore, they filed a lawsuit to stop Del Oro and alleged that this dumping of waste in the conservation was dangerous for the ecosystem. The pile of rotting peels lying around with flies hovering were adversely affecting the wildlife and local residents. Tico Fruit didn't stop at the suit. They also launched a full-blown media war emphasizing that the dumping of orange peels was destroying the national park, though it wasn't true. The smear campaign managed to turn the entire country against Del Oro, leading to public outcry and angst. The case then ended up in the Supreme Court. The environmental groups like Rainforest Alliance assured the court that this project was ecologically safe, but the Supreme Court ruled against Del Oro. So the project had to be shut down. However, the 12,000 tons of orange peels that had already been dumped were left behind. Over the years, everyone forgot about the project. But, 16 years later, it drew attention again. 
A team of Princeton researchers had read about this project and decided to visit the site. They were curious about what had happened to the 12,000 tons of waste dumped there in 1977. But they were left awestruck when they arrived here, because they were unable to locate the site. The peels had vanished. They searched for any trace they could find and in doing so ended up getting lost in the rainforest. They finally came across an old sign, mostly covered by jungle vines. The style of the sign was the same as researchers had used many years ago to mark the barren, low-quality soil. It was then that they realized the whole rainforest was the original dump site with the barren soil. Turns out the peels had turned the barren land fertile. After further exploring the area, the team of researchers found out that there had been a 176% increase in the above-ground biomass of these seven acres of land. They came across a fig tree that was so big it took three people to wrap their arms around its trunk, and in the branches of this tree they found a taira, a rainforest weasel, almost the size of a dog. But the most mind-blowing thing about this forest was the rich diversity of the canopy. They were able to identify 24 tree species. This was quite a contrast from the land only 300 feet away, where they were able to count only eight species of trees. This was evidence that an entire rainforest had grown on the previously barren patch of land. It seems miraculous, but it was actually the result of Jansud and Horwak's plan. The site was overrun initially with invasive grasses, but these were buried under the tons of orange peels, causing it to decompose and form a loamy, rich compost. These peels were perfect as they were treated with limonene oil that prevents growth of invasive plants. The degraded peels further provided all the essential nutrients including potassium, phosphorus and nitrogen. This helped the native plants thrive and in just 16 years a new rainforest came into being. As much as we'd like to replicate this experiment everywhere, it's not as simple as it seems. The Orange Peel Project was a special case. Costa Rica lies close to the equator, meaning it remains warm and humid year-round. The climate here is perfect for decomposing vegetation and for faster growth. Using this method in other parts of the world, especially in freezing temperatures, slows down the process and even halts it. The orange peels are a game changer. They don't just help us restore rainforests. In fact, scientists are using these rinds for a bunch of different purposes. The Orange Peel Exploitation Company is an organization dedicated to finding ways to put these peels to good use. They're researching on using these peels as a potential biofuel and in reducing waste from single-use plastics. A company called Aimplas is trying to use orange peels to create biophysics. Imagine drinking orange juice from a carton made of orange peels. Cool, right? Researchers at University of Granada have invented a wastewater filtration method utilizing orange peels. The chemical makeup of these peels allows them to filter out toxins like ammonia from water, making it drinkable. Are orange peels really going to save the world? What do you think? Tell us in the comments. The Rainforest Café We all crave a hot cup of coffee as soon as we wake up, but humans aren't the only species who need an early morning caffeine dose to function. Forests also love the fresh aroma of brewed coffee. People from the University of Hawaii were inspired by the orange peel experiment, so they decided to test coffee, wondering if it could restore a rainforest too. The trees needed a lot of coffee, so the researchers used coffee waste. Surprisingly, the coffee bean begins life as a berry, and after harvesting, 50% of these end up getting wasted as their bright red skin is discarded and only the seed is used. These skins were collected for this project for a study conducted in 2018. They were deposited on a deforested land that was invaded by palisade grass growing up to 16 feet in length. This tall grass blocks light, which native trees required to grow. So the researchers made a spread of one and a half feet of coffee skin pulp on top of the grasses, smothering the foliage and leading to decay. The heat generated by composting finished off the root systems of these grasses too. The coffee pulp and decomposed grasses mixed together to provide a nutrient-rich environment, causing the trees to grow faster and thrive. Just after two years, the barren plot was found 80% covered in tree canopy, some being 15 feet or more. Researchers compared the trees to adjacent land only to find out that coffee-treated land had trees four times taller on average. Can coffee be used on a larger scale in order to fight the deforestation caused by human activity? Not really, because the process has its disadvantages. The decomposing pulp attracts too many insects and flies, making life hard for residents in the area. 
Watershed contamination can also occur due to the use of coffee fertilizer. This means the pulp can be washed downstream and lead to excessive algae growth. This could cause huge algae blooms capable of destroying the delicate aquatic ecosystem. The pulp may also contain harmful pesticides in trace amounts that could lead to water pollution. So we really need to weigh all the pros and cons before using coffee fertilizer on a larger scale. The Green Wall of China The massive Gobi Desert is spread across 500,000 miles of North China, and with the changing climate, it's only expanding. It's considered the fastest growing desert on the planet. It consumes about 2,250 miles of grasslands annually. This accelerated desertification is caused by the frenzied industrialization of the country in the 20th century. The second largest economy in the world paid the price of this progress in form of overgrazing and deforestation. This has dwindled the water and timber resources of the country too. The desert is closing in on massively populated cities at an alarming speed. The Chinese government is trying to keep the desert at bay by building a great green wall. No, it's not the Great Wall of China 2.0. In fact, it's a massive expanse of greenery. The North Shelter Program was launched in 1978 and was aimed at blocking the expansion of the Gobi Desert with the help of greenery. In 40 years, 19.4 million acres of forest has been brought to life. This has led to the reversal of 130,000 square miles of desertification. That's more area than the entire state of New Mexico. The program is supposed to grow 87 million acres of new forest by 2050. This program is pretty successful and has managed to restore 93.2% of Maozu Desert into a forest. Sadly, it's not entirely good news. Initially, they practiced monoculture and planted just one fast-growing non-native variety of tree species. These trees are depleting the water and nutrient reserves of the soil. Due to this, native tree populations are dying. These single-species forests are at a greater risk of being wiped out entirely by disease. While the Great Green Wall might have increased tree cover drastically, the country suffered a net loss of 6.6% of the native species in forests. Investigations also revealed that farmers were cutting down native trees so they could collect the money being offered to plant new trees. The Gobi Desert has actually created a much healthier ecosystem than this artificial forest. The desert is home to a variety of animals and plants, including the snow leopard and the two-humped Bactrian camel. No doubt nature truly functions better on its own without human manipulation. Realizing the consequences, the Chinese government banned felling of the native forest species between 2014 and 2017. Besides that, they've also diversified their new forests by planting a variety of trees, shrubs and herbs to enhance biodiversity. The farmers are being offered money to plant native species and not to cut down vegetation in old growth forests. Picnic on the Moon Jordan is home to an incredibly dry and barren landscape called Wadi Rum. It's often called Valley of the Moon despite the fact that its rugged cliff and reddish sands make it look much more like Mars. Ridley Scott, a popular film director, used it as an outside filming location in his movie The Martian. This valley is situated in the second most water-poor country in the world. Jordan barely has 150 cubic meters of water per person annually. In comparison, the U.S. has 9,000 cubic meters of water per person per year. The Wadi Room doesn't even have that 150 cubic meters. From March to December, the valley sees about 5 millimeters of rainfall in a month. That's about 1 teaspoon of water. Water may be scarce here, but it's a great picnic spot. Amongst these barren dunes, there's a rum farm that's thriving. Stretching across 5,000 acres, it's the largest farm in Jordan. It produces 20,000 tons of potatoes, 10,000 tons of onions, and many tons of other soft fruit like peaches, figs, pears, and oranges annually. But how are they farming without water? From above the rum farm is laid out a series of circular fields. The farmers draw water from underground aquifers. The water is drawn to the surface by pumps, and it's then used to irrigate the fields with the help of pivoting ramps with water nozzles. The water lost to environment is prevented by using plastic poly tunnels. Succulents and legumes are planted along with soft crops to provide them ground cover. The gel content of succulents helps lower the temperature of the surface along with reducing the effects of shifting sands. 
These methods are quite similar to agricultural practices of the ancient Egyptians and Nabataeans. But where did they get this idea from? Whatever the source of their knowledge, turning the desert into farmland has greatly benefited Jordan. The country imports 98% of its food, but this flourishing harvest in Wadi Rum will help the country become self-sufficient. This method might soon be adopted by other countries facing food shortage too. Especially with the increasing population, the world hunger is bound to increase. Global food production needs to be doubled in order to meet the growing demand of the expanding population. We need to produce more food in the coming 40 years than has been produced in the past 8,000 years. Crazy, right? That doesn't mean we should try turning all the deserts green. These are also necessary. We need the resources they offer, including minerals like gypsum, potassium, nitrates and more. More than 50% of our copper comes from the deserts of Australia, Mexico and Chile, and the Chinese and American deserts contain heaps of gold. Converting these to farmland will not only diminish these priceless resources, but also compromise many ecosystems. We can't change everything for our benefit. Accepting that despite trying we are powerless in the face of nature is the best policy.